We are small press traffic based in the Bay Area on the unceded land of the Ohlone people. Um, very uh, grateful to have the guests we have today and to be um, sharing this, this time with you. Um, before we get started, I wanted to invite a friend of Small Press Traffic, Kelsey Street Press, uh, Aaron Wilson at Kelsey Street Press to say a few words and also uh, offer a, a gift to us all here who are here in attendance. Thanks, Sid. <clears throat> so yes, I'm Erin Wilson and I'm one of the members of Kelsey Street Press. I actually see tons of members of the press and friends of the press and authors from the press here today. Um, if anybody doesn't know, we've been around for 47 years. And in that time, we've published many great authors, including the first books of Myungmi Kim, Banu Kapil, and Renee Gladman. Most recently, we published Martha Reed. And actually in 2022, we have three great titles coming. Uh, Denise Newman, who's gonna be talking, her new book, The Redesignation of Paradise is coming. Uh, Mihi Kim, she read with SPT back in the fall. Her book, Nomenclature, is gonna be coming out and a new edition of Banu Kapil's Incubation. So those are all really exciting. So yes, I am here because back in 2014, uh, Kelsey Street published Premonitions. It's a um, thought-provoking book um, from Attel. And it came our way because one of our co-founders, Rena Rosenwasser, who is here with us, she and Attel were close friends. So we're very fortunate that through their friendship, we were able to publish this book. Um, the 20% discount, we never charge for shipping, so it's a super good deal. Um, the uh, discount code is SPT, not very tricky. And I wanted to just read to give you a little um, picture of what Premonition is like. Uh, Kevin Killian wrote, Attel struggles with meaning in ways that can teach us about the human heart, its memories, its sacrifices its triumphs. So you can order the book and check out our whole catalog at kelseystreetpress.org and 20% SPT. Thanks. Thank you, Erin. I'm going to actually just take a moment to drop that into the chat. There's the book, discount code SPT. There we go. Um, Okay, um, so uh, we often, well, most of what Small Press Traffic does is offer readings and performances. Um, and th this is um, inaugurating our conversation series. So it's an experiment and you're all a part of it. We are going to, um, uh, I'm gonna invite the guests, uh, Denise Newman, Brandon Shimoda and Dina Chalabi to, um, engage in a conversation among each other. And then we will open things up for the rest of us to conversate, uh, conversate, converse. Okay. Um, as the conversation is happening, the first part of the conversation, as our guests are speaking among each other, you are all more than welcome to um, drop questions, comments, reflections into the chat that we can perhaps, if there's time, loop back to after. Um, we can also, I will say that this is being recorded. If you do not want to appear on the video recording, which will be public, um, we can, re you can ask your questions in the chat. If you are open, we will encourage um, folks to, um, unmute and open your video if you so choose. Um, so without further ado, I will allow our speakers to introduce themselves and share a bit about how they uh, come, have come to know Atel, and then we will go from there. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dina, Brandon, and Denise. Thank you. So I'm going to begin. Um, so first, I want to say thank you all for coming. And 
Special thanks to Sid and SPT for giving us this opportunity to talk about Itel's life and work and um, just remember who she was and how important she was to, in particular, the Bay Area poetry scene. Um, her writing and her presence and the international perspective I think she gave to poetry was so important um, for all of us. And also her press, the Post Apollo Press, which she ran for many years with Simone Fatal, her partner, um, published a lot of Bay Area poets as well as national and international poets. And um, I feel like anybody who is publishing poetry should just go straight to heaven. <laughs> it's such a labor of love with very little um, uh, pay, you know, monetary payment. So um, I am a poet and a translator and I teach at uh, CCA for many years. Um, I'll tell you how I first met Atel, and I think it's really interesting that people often like to give their origin stories with Atel where they met her because she, um, she makes such a strong impression. And that's how I felt. I feel like my first meeting with her, I was like this chick that got imprinted. Um, and she was like my, my poetry mother. Uh, I had just moved to the Bay Area around 1990 um, and I was actually giving a reading at the Book Depot in Mill Valley, and one of my friends was um, working for the Post Apollo Press, and so um, Atel came to the reading, and I talked to her, and I met her, and I, you know, I got a sense of her imagination and thinking before I read her work, and I was immediately interested in in her and getting to know her better, and it was a really important um, point in my life because I felt that, um, well, having moved here from New Jersey and Denmark, I was just so overwhelmed by the nature of the West Coast and um, the way it tells connected with it and wrote about it in this very passionate, um, cosmic sense where she placed the human within that landscape really resonated with me and my work. And so she was one of the few poetry mentors I felt that I had uh, who could offer me like a path through that, through my own um, proclivities towards that relationship with nature. And um, I remember Simone telling me, you have to read uh, Journey to Mount Tamalpais. So that was one of the first books that I read. And, and it's such a beautiful book in that everything is integrated in it. Um, you know, Atel's poetics, her ideas about painting and poetry, and of course her connection to the mountain, uh, which was a lifelong connection that she had. So then we continue to have a correspondence, um, you know, right up until I think my last letter from her is from last summer. And um, so there, there was this beautiful intimacy in the communication through the writing and also through our lifelong correspondence. And um, Atel also had a sense of marking the important um, milestones in people's lives. And so when I gave birth, she and Simone came and visited us and brought a painting um, for Eva, our daughter, and um, which, you know, I always think about that connection whenever I look at this painting in our house. And, um, and then every letter she would write, she would say, how is Eva? You know, for 20 years, she'd be asking, how is Eva? She's always very concerned about the children. So those are just some initial memories of her. Um, hi, I'm Brandon Shimoda. Um, I would love to see that painting. I'm assuming it's somewhere. It's not the painting behind you, but it's somewhere. Um, I, right, so origin story. It's funny because I, I feel, well, maybe it's not funny, but I think that since November, since Atel passed away, I feel like I'm, um, I'm, 
being reintroduced to her as a person, as a friend, not as an influence, but as an inspiration. Um, so I, I feel like there was the before and then there's the after and the after is now. And then, uh, the, the before is that um, my partner, Dot Devota, who's here, I believe, we traveled to Lebanon, we traveled to Beirut in 2009. And um, part of the part of the preparation for that trip was writing to people that we admired, and Atel was the first person I wrote to. Um, I wrote her a letter on a typewriter, and I, I don't remember how I knew what her address was, so I sent it into the ether, and it somehow managed to reach her. It was a love letter, which is something I think I used to do more often, um, writing love letters to people I admired and, and occasionally hearing back from them. Um, so I wrote her a letter, said that my partner and I were, were going to Beirut. I don't remember what I asked after that because I didn't save a copy. Maybe a week later, maybe two weeks later, she emailed and she gave me three different phone numbers and said, try all of these. <laughs> two phone numbers in, in Beirut and a phone number in Paris. Um, that was the summer of 2009, and then we corresponded for 10 years after that. Um, a year after that, she invited me to edit this uh, retrospective collection of her writings for Nightboat, which eventually became called um, To Look at the Sea is to Become What One Is, which was a project that I worked on with uh, my friend Tom Donovan. Um, maybe for two or three years, just spending time with her work. But really what that project was for me, or at least the way that I remember it, was the process of becoming friends with someone, um, friends with multiple people, Tom included, but in particular, Atel, and what that meant, and the kind of generosity that um, friendship was an invitation into, and a way of seeing and a way of experiencing the, the variety of difficult things that life throws at you through the perspective and through the kindness of somebody like Atel. So actually the, the, the project and the process of putting that book together in a way has evaporated. I mean, there's, there's, there's like a paper trail of what actually happened, but I think that what I actually remember is my correspondence with her. But now I feel like I'm, um, becoming reintroduced to what all of that meant. So spending years reading her work and spending years corresponding with her and feeling like I had somewhat of a grasp on the nature of this person and the nature of the dynamic between us. Um, but in the last few months, I feel like I either don't know anything um, or I don't remember anything so that I'm in a place of everything being new which is kind of startling, a little scary, but also very um, encouraging. Um, so my relationship to her now is as one being reintroduced to the mind of somebody um, who I, I love deeply. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Denise. And thank you, Sid, for Bensonal Press um, for the invitation. Um, I'm Dina Chalabi, and um, it's a real pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I, uh, I don't have as long a sort of a, I certainly don't have as long a correspondence um, with Etel um, as my, my two uh, fellow speakers here, but I, uh, well, I do, but it's mostly in my head. Um, so I first um, I first came across um, Atel's work uh, soon after I moved to the Bay Area, so 2006, 2007. I was at grad school at Berkeley and I was doing research on the history of Sufism in the Bay Area, uh, which led me to the pr uh, professor at Dominican University. And in the context of a conversation, um, he mentioned his, his uh, former colleague, Atel Adnan, and recommended her poetry to me. So I began uh, reading her work. I think the first book that I read was there. Um, swiftly followed by um, the novel Sit Mary Rose, and um, which had a, a tremendous um, impact on me. And then a book to which I've been returning in the last few days um, in the heart of the heart of another country um, and specifically the piece um, to be in a time of war um, for obvious reasons. Um, 
When I began reading Atel's work, I had such a shock of recognition, uh, a sense of familiarity with a, her worldview that I don't think that I, I certainly had not had before, and I, I don't think that I've had since. Um, and the more that I've read of her work over the years and the more that I've learned about her life, the more I've realized that we have a, a series of fully uncanny similarities in, in our life stories and in the stories of our family. Um, I'll give you just one example. Um, Atel's father and my great-grandfather were both at the Ottoman Military Academy with Ataturk at the very end of the 19th century, so it's very possible that they knew each other. Um, and that sometimes it's just, you know, a little astounding to me. Um, when I, uh, I began working in, in the visual arts, um, when I uh, moved to Doha in Qatar in 2009, and then that's when I began learning about um, her visual practices. Um, we had a piece of work in, in the collection at the uh, Arab Museum of Modern Art that I helped to open in 2010, um, and we included that piece in, in the exhibition. Um, and also 2010 was the moment when, when I, I met her, we invited her to participate in, the, in an event um, prior to the opening of the museum um, in Paris, um, and um, Atel spoke, um, about nostalgia and memory in the Arab world with um, an artist who had been, uh, who was a mentee of hers, uh, Khalil Jurij. Uh, they spoke incredibly beautifully with one another. It was a very, you know, very moving um, conversation. And afterwards, I, you know, somewhat starstruck, went up and sat down uh, with her and, and Simone in, in a booth um, at this restaurant um, in overlooked Paris. And, you know, I just thanked her for being, uh, for being present with us and for participating in the event. And, you know, had barely said anything and she just looks at me and says, you're a writer and you're not writing, why not? And uh, I, I didn't have a lot to say at the time. Uh, she could ask me that question today, it would still be true. Um, and, uh, but I found, you know, we had ended up having a fascinating conversation um, about language and uh, sort of what is a mother tongue and um, sort of and tr translation, the translation between images and words. It, you know, it was just incredibly powerful and beautiful. And that was the only time that I actually sat down with her to, to speak. Um, we, uh, I invited her again to participate in an event in London a few years later in 2013. Unfortunately, she could not leave Paris to come to, to London that time, but she sent a very beautiful letter. We had did an event um, about sort of mapping uh, London as an Arab city and specifically um, looking at the legacy of Taib Saleh, the, uh, the Sudanese novelist, and she wrote a very beautiful tribute to him. Um, and that's sort of one of the things that um, I've noted just in the sort of my brief um, interactions with Atel have just always been, um, you know, what Denise and Brandon also described, the tremendous generosity of vision, um, the kindness, um, and just the, you know, tremendous, uh, the variety of ways in which she, she has been an inspiration. So I'm, uh, delighted to be here. I'm also delighted to see a number of people who I know had uh, much sort of longer and deeper relationships with her than I, and I look forward to hearing from everybody during the course of this conversation. Thank you. I was struck by something that Brandon said, um, returning to Atel's work and how it, um, everything seemed new to you. And I'm so curious about that myself, how I've read, you know, her books and it, it always, they always seem fresh. Mm. How, how is that possible? <laughs> there's the, there's this um, sensation or phenomenon that I feel like ever, because I, I started rereading Journey to Mount Tam last night um and it's i've read it so many times but i feel like i've never read it before and i it's a new edition so then i thought well maybe it was <laughs> maybe there's like new material in here and it's i mean partly maybe the way that my brain disintegrates after a reading experience um that that brings me back to a book so that i can like reintegrate myself but um, it's, it's, it's fresh. It's like, it's like, I think about a painting that remains wet forever. Like the paint remains wet. And that's, that's kind of the feeling I get with so much of her writing is that it's still wet. It's still, it's still in the process of being made of drying, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
I, Dina mentioned to be in a time of war and um, Dina, you were saying that's something that you've been reading maybe right now, today, last night. Um, and some, you know, something that we return to, but I, I, I guess I wonder what that, what that particular piece means to you or, or what happens to you while you're reading it, what it does. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's, this is a piece um, uh, that um, Atel wrote um, in uh, the period just um, around the invasion of Iraq in 2003, for those of you who might not be familiar, um, that particular conflict, um, you know, what was obviously hugely impactful on the world, but also hugely impactful on me personally. Um, and like Atel, I was not, you know, anywhere near it. And I think to me, this the sort of notion of, of uh, engaging with a, a conflict with which one vehemently disagrees at a distance, um, but that, you know, uh, that sensation of, having uh you know a tremendous sense of of loss the kind of what what Atel was even talking about in the uh the in the the uh interview that we just watched sort of the following a tragedy um at a distance in a place that is quite so beautiful i think she you know she talks so much in, in um about uh you know the the way that her practice uh well her, you know her painting is a process of paying attention but obviously she does so through her writing as well a process of bearing witness and i think that piece in particular you know it's written as a series of of um uh, you know, imperative statements. And I think just the way that she does that, sort of the way that she kind of keeps herself present and keeps the reader present every single, with every single sentence, every single um, uh, observation is just so incredibly powerful. So at a moment when uh, I'm, you know, I think, you know, I have a tendency to just let my mind, uh, you know, go in, in sort of so many different directions. Um, one of the reasons that that piece is powerful is both that it kind of centers me um, emotionally on, sort of the, the difficult feelings that I'm having about a, a conflict and at the same time it also um, grounds me in, you know, in a moment and in the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you feel like in a way, in a certain way, a piece like that, and maybe all of her work in general, does give us the permission to let our mind go in a variety of directions that we normally feel maybe ashamed of or that we begin to question that there is a there is this like the generosity in that piece is there is a permission in being in a time of war for our mind to really kind of be scattered um, in the midst of also recentering ourselves as you're saying yeah permission to be to be scattered perhaps and to to sort of take a flight to imagine you know what's happening but at the same time to permission to to breathe, to sit down, to have a cup of tea, to have a conversation with someone that those moments, those, those, uh, you know, it's almost like she's doing that, uh, she's bringing together different aspects of connection and, you know, and, and encouraging one to, uh, to consider how important it is to connect um, in, in those moments, especially. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you know, she does as with, you know, with so many ways in her work sort of cut through, um, cut through boundaries. Um, and at the same time sort of brings together these incredibly, um, yeah, they're just a tremendous different ways in which um, dishes and, and fragments kind of start to, uh, uh, start to coalesce around these ideas of, yeah, a conflict. Um, but yeah, her power, yeah, the observation plus kind of the emotional power and, and, uh, and clarity I think is something that I find very, very um, helpful in all, in all of her work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a real spaciousness that, um, you know, she is matching her thoughts to reality and aware of creating, you know, within this process of, you know, that it's this meeting between reality and the thoughts and that they're intermingling and, and creating a kind of reality and that they're, that there are gaps between. And so as a reader, you know, you're following the movement of her mind um, and aware of the movement of your own mind, and which is always changing. And, you know, each time you come to the work, it's, it's a different mind, it's a different moment, and it's somehow still relevant, I think, because her work 
she gets at the essential just the way she, you know, marked the birth of my daughter. She, like, <laughs> Etel could pick out in the whole mess of things, like the most important thing in that moment, you know, and, and be putting these side by side. And so I feel like reading her work, it's always so like grounding and clarifying at the same time for my own life, whatever's going on in my life. It's a kind of a oracular presence that she has in her work. Um, and it's always yielding a kind of new, a new meaning of life. That meaning keeps changing. It's so, it's, and it's so interesting to think about the, what the mountain, what the mountain was for Etel all her life. Um, and how it tells work can be like that mountain for us, you know, that kind of like centering thing that keeps changing, but it's always in relationship. Like the way she talks about Mount Tamalpais as something, and he keeps, she keeps looking at it from different angles. Um, at some point she says, it is her, it is, she is it, or it is her. <laughs> it's like it has the, there's this reciprocal relationship but it's grounding her in place. It's grounding, in, and, and it's another thing about it tell, she's like local, she's locally aware of her environment. Like what, where are the, where are the spots within this environment? You know, where are the sacred places? And then also her consciousness is traveling outward to conflicts and people she loved, you know, around the world. I'm so envious of everyone who lives within range of that mountain. <laughs> There's actually a mountain right outside our front door and I've been, I feel like I've been avoiding it and I'm starting to reread Journey to Mount Tamalpais as a way to just be more present where I am. I mean, I open the door and the first thing I see is this mountain. Um, it's interesting that grounding and clarifying those two ideas because I've been thinking about mystery and how mm, one of the things that I feel that I'm struck by, I guess, with her writing, but maybe also her in general, is this, this process of study by which you become deeply familiar with something in a way that preserves its mystery. And I, it's something magical about that. I don't. Um, so grounding, clarifying, and not mystifying, that's not the right word, but that it's like the the closer you get to it and the more attentive you become to it, the uh, more attentive you become in relation to that thing, the more a certain kind of mystery is released, um, which, which is, I think, a, one of the many marvels of, of what, she, what she did. There's a line in, of Cities and Women that's something like, this is, a, this is a butchering, but something like, the way you look at something becomes one of its definitions, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. I made with um, many years ago when the Wattis had the show of Etel's work, um, I made with my grad students an installation in the Garden of the Grad Writing Studio. And um, we took one of Etel's sentences a very complex sense, and we painted it around um, the perimeter of an empty um, basin, and then we connected each letter to something in the garden uh, that began with that letter. And this is the sentence that um, we wrote. It's from Seasons. She says, oh, please, nature is no metaphor, but the origin of itself and of its manifestations. And that includes language, which is produced in order to give it a name. So it was, it was good to think about that complicated sentence when we were making this installation for several weeks. But um, I, I really have carried this as something core about Atel's work that she doesn't feel like language separates her from nature. On the contrary, it's like language comes out of nature. It's, it's invented to give nature its names. Um, so it's the thing that connects us to nature. That was, that was her relationship to writing, I think, that spontaneity, you know, that it's coming from this source that is beyond 
personality really or ego it's just kind of like uh, innate abilities to produce poems to produce language you know like a tree might produce leaves <laughs> In my more sentimental moments, um, I feel like Etel's work and maybe her life in general um, reenacts the creation of the universe. <laughs> uh, in my more sentimental moments. So bear with me. The poems, the, the writing that she was doing early in her career was very, very hard. Um, her, anti, her more explicitly anti-war work the Arab apocalypse, um, the poems about um, Palestinian, re Palestinian refugee camps. H hard, not in the sense of difficult, but more in the sense of the materials were very jagged. Um, the poetry was, was wounded or it felt like it was the manifestation of woundedness. And you can sort of track that um, for a while until at a certain point, it began to be replaced by a softness. And it was almost like the core material of the formation of the universe began to be converted into elements, into these like primary elements, like, like water and wind, um, the sea. And until you get to the series of, of final books, night and surge and time and shifting the silence. Um, and then sort of like, and then a dispersal, ultimately a dispersal within that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I guess that's, I'm just, I've been thinking about that because now I feel like, um, I don't know, it's very, it's very strange and very hard to enter into the memorial phase of a relationship. And it happens overnight, right? That's the phase that I don't really, I don't really want to be in. But one of, I guess, the invitations of that phase is that you do, um, I guess, have the opportunity to think about, well, what did it all mean? Um, how did it begin and how did it end and where is it now? So I do think about her as being this, this element, as having become forged by fire and by war and by the, the ongoing apocalypse, um, an element in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that, does that sound ridiculous? <laughs> I, I love it. I, I really feel that I'm, I'm struck by the, you know, the, the last books being, having these very elemental titles and focuses. Um, and I love that you concluded the selection with her essay about love. Uh, the cost for love we are not willing to pay. Um, you know, this is, this is only going up to 2011, but you could hear in that interview that Sid played, um, you know, she's talking about basically her love of life and um, life is a miracle, right? So there, it does feel like some kind of crystallization occurring you know a process it's not it's never it's never there it's never hard and fast but yeah it's a process Dina do you see that in the paintings too or in this what it that's a big question I think um I mean you know she's she talks about the paintings being sort of you know the place of her place of you know a place for joy and you know, I do think we see we see that, and we see her love of life in them very much. I, I was reflecting on um, Brandon when you were talking about this idea of sort of becoming closer to something and, and knowing it um, to the extent that it re sort of retains its its mystery um, and its magic. That that to me seems like a really good definition of a process of loving, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and and kind of connecting. And so, you know, I, and I think that through her writing and, and her painting. I mean, it is it is very much about both reflect her love of life and of 
this planet, even as she were often talked about wanting to escape it. But I do think that, you know, there was that, that love for, for people, um, that love for her community, that love for the places that she spent time in um, just is, I mean, it's what kind of keeps me coming back and what, what I find so, where I find the freshness. And I think also is what has sustained me during this period of, of, you know, what I knew would be, would be grieving, but, you know, and you kind of, again, you prepare for something when someone, when, when one of your heroes is a nonagenarian, but it still uh, was more than, than I was anticipating. And I imagine that's true for many. Um, yeah, just coming back to that, that idea, that sort of, that feeling of love that I just feel like, you know, radiates. I, I gave a talk when, when there was, um, uh, when Etel's work was on display at SFMOMA in 2018, um, I gave a talk in the gallery and, and just asked people to, to sit and stand and look in front of the paintings and sort of tell me, you know, what they what they saw. And the, the first, uh, you know, the first couple of people said the same thing, which was that, that they were vibrating. And so that energy that, she, you know, she talked about that these paintings both kind of giving, you know, exuding energy and sort of, and giving um, and, uh, giving energy and I just found that sort of very powerful and I, I still sort of feel that whether it's I'm reading her words on a page or looking at one of her images. How about you Denise and I'm curious about when you teach because I know you continue to teach Atal's work um, how has that process evolved for you and how do your students kind of respond to her work um, and how is that potentially how has that changed over time? Hmm. Yeah um... It's true, it, it changes as what's going on in the world. Um, when we made that installation, uh, we read an Arab apocalypse in the garden and um, it was another sense of it. It was a heavy fatigue of war and mourning. And, um, but this fall we read it uh, in my grad workshop. Actually in the middle of reading it, um, we were reading it over two weeks, uh, Etel passed away and that was very moving for all of us. I mean, we felt like the vibrations within the, the work, Lynn Marie Kirby came to our class and led us in a choral reading of the Arab apocalypse. And um, it was very powerful reading it in unison, harmonizing the voices, reading that work. Um, and then a few days later, she passed away and we all felt that if we wanted just to be in the work, not to talk about it, just to let it resonate and be in it and listen to it, it we were kind of mute actually in front of it. Um, so yeah, I have taught her books over the years and um, Many students have really appreciated, I think, having, having that model to be able to um, write about things happening in, within their own personal experiences and then connecting it out into larger issues happening in the world. Like it was a, it was a way to orient oneself within you know, things that matter. I think one thing also that um, we're going to just kind of shift organically to conversation. That's that's good. But um, that came up uh, in our previous conversation when the three of us, when the four of us talked is also what was very instructive about her in terms of like living the life of a poet or living the life as I mean, it's interesting in the video, she refutes the word artist, but um, but so much of the work that was left and, and, and I'm also thinking about you know, the complexity of being in relation in this memorial phase, as Brandon put it, um, despite the fact that so much of her work is life-giving and, you know, vibrant and alive. Um, and so, um, but, but thinking about how instructive, not just the work is that was left, but, but the life that was lived, the life as, um, as a person in the world and how one orients oneself to one's surroundings and how one holds um, despair and atrocity and also beauty in the world and um, these things that uh, are kind of classically you know a poet's uh, a poet's charge uh, how does one hold all of those things the misery and the and the beauty um, and, and put it put it through one's work and hold it in oneself and and be in the world I wonder if anyone has thoughts to share about that
there's so much there's so much to draw from one of the first things that um this i don't this is probably not an answer to <laughs> your question sid but um i very early on when i was when when we were emailing each other which i which i feel like yeah i'm i, I have a, an enormous debt to pay um Patel gave me a list of books that that um, she was thinking about that she thought maybe I would be interested in reading. And I wrote back something very simple. Um, thank you so much for the recommendations. And in a way, she kind of took me to task for using the word recommendation. She said, um, I would never recommend anything. I'm sharing with you things that are meaningful to me as a way to begin to create common ground such a it was such a simple thing but i felt like every time every everything she wrote every sentence every line every word was in a way instructing me um but even the word instructing is probably the wrong word um encouraging or inviting me to be more of more of myself more present with myself you know um, as opposed to like this sort of bureaucratic robot that I probably was when I was 25. Um, for some reason that come that came to mind. <laughs> yeah, when I what I said about meeting her in the beginning, what was so impressive to me was how she could express her passionate relationship to nature and also her insights um, that these, I felt like these things, you know, it was so easy to come close to sentimentality or to didacticism. Um, and so that, you know, touching with onto the passion or revealing insights could lead you there. And so, it was a it was an encouragement like to go with the passions to trust the passions and also to trust language and oneself um, and I think coming back to her work it's always like returning to myself actually returning to her work is always a returning to my own self and what's important to me like she reminds me of that and I was struck by uh, Simone Fatal saying recently that um, above all she thought that Atel was a teacher not in a conventional sense, you know, more informally, she was a teacher. And uh, Simone said she, she just get, gave everything she had. That was just her way. Um, and it's true. I mean, I feel that. I feel that generosity in, in relating with me all of these years. Um, and it, so it was so like undidactic. It was all through modeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I'll just I just add to that the sort of sense of you know what it means to be a poet and an artist. There's a sense of sort of finding, you know, she she described how she kind of became herself or found herself in California, um, and you know she'd been in Paris and sort of studied philosophy at the Sorbonne at the same time as Sartre and Beauvoir, and she always talked about sort of existentialism being something that was, you know, important to her it sort of struck me that, I mean, I just think the sort of process of, of finding one's own freedom that she was able to achieve in her life as she was also so, you know, very much kind of in, in you know, connected um, and in community. I think that is something that, that often people uh, refer to when they think about um, how she has modeled and, and, and taught even informally uh, others. I think to me, again, kind of having, you know, spent time in the Arab world and sort of understanding, you know, a uh, little bit about how poets from that part of the world have influenced her own thinking, her own language and, and how she herself has, you know, is, is you know, now, um, you know, held up as, as a poet in that context too. I, I do, I think I am excited to see how we learn um, in the future more about the sort of the connectivity between her different communities. I think, you know, we, we know a lot about how she, um, how she existed and, and supported so many here in the Bay Area. And, um, and at the same time, you know, she had this, these tremendously rich networks in, in other parts of, of the world. And 
uh, obviously there are connections, but I think they'll, it'll be very interesting to learn more about, about those and about how um, her, her teaching and, and her um, just existence as, a, as an inspirational force um, continues to radiate. Mm -hmm. Here's kind of a uh, naive question that it's that's really exciting to think about how do you how do you how do you foresee that beginning to emerge that that like all of those different facets of her life and connectivity how do you think that might begin to emerge Brandy, you asking me <laughs> <laughs> i guess so yeah um i mean i think there you know there are certain people um who been present for her and who know you know some of these communities much more intimately um, and who can, can act as these kind of you know, bridge builders I'm uh, I can see one of them here I'm looking at you Omar um, mm. who uh, you know I think there are you know I, I, I think there are just plenty more of these conversations to be had you know privately publicly where we you know we come together and, and talk about about the force that she um, has been and continues to be. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen some tremendously beautiful writing about her writing and about her painting. You know, um, Kaylin Wilson Goldie is just a, you know, has written this beautiful monograph and she has also just chronicled um, Atel's um, journey through the art world um, over time. And, you know, well, I'm sure, I hope that Kaylin continues to write um, about her. Yeah, I just, I think it's, it's more of this, um, a lot more of this and more voices. Mm -hmm. Um, question here about painting and writing. I thought it was actually quite interesting in that video that she talked about um, poetry as a social form and painting as a solitary form. I think that there's also this, there's just this kind of historical notion of like the poet being kind of isolated with their, with their writing. Um, it was interesting to have her inverse that. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, if there's anything towards that question about painting and writing um, that folks want to address, also welcome to um, for other folks to unmute. Um, you know we we mentioned Omar. If you if you want to share some thoughts or any others, uh, we can open up the floor now for folks who have had ongoing relationships with Atel want to share some thoughts and reflections. Um, and those of you not comfortable with doing that while we're recording, I would like to, I would be open to sort of like giving another five or ten minutes to the recording, turning off the recording, and then having five or five or 10 minutes for, for a more informal chat. So uh, I'm gonna fill out the room here, but uh, keeping all that open. Yes, and a, and a question about the reprinting of the reader. Is that happening um, April? When is that, Brenda? Me, um, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I'm assuming that's a night boat thing, but I, yeah, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just a ghost in the folds of, of that book. <laughs> okay. Let's turn off the recording um, and, ah, Megan comes through. Let's see this. I experienced to tell, I'm gonna read this aloud. Thank you, Megan. I experienced to tell as a different sort of person. She seemed to come from a larger historical time and a larger cultural space. I would feel in talking to her a sort of condensation taking place where these larger realms would enter my immediate experience. I wonder if this is singular to her or if there's a larger historical role and context for poets in the Arab world. It also seems culturally distinct to the Western idea of the progress and perfection of the individual self. That's so interesting. I, I mean, it, from what I understand, and again, I'm not, I'm nowhere an expert on this, but my, my impression is that Atal only started to learn and read uh, many of um, the Arab poets that she came to revere once she was in the US. Um, and that it became part of her journey um, to as a poet and you know as Brandon mentioned you know many of her early poems are in re direct response to the Vietnam War but obviously many of the poets that were um, uh, that were um, writing in sort of the mid-20th century were also responding to you know 
other kinds of, of questions of, of conflict and um, and so, you know, she was, she, there were many that she was in dialogue with, but she was also very much in dialogue with, with everyone here. So I do think there's a fusion there. I do think there's, she, um, you know, she did learn, uh, which at least she was observing the ways in which um, um, poets do tend to look back at, at, at to history um, in many, in, in, in different kinds of ways um, than they do here. But I think in, in form, um, they were also, you know, pushing boundaries in, in ways that she was she was looking to and learning from. But as I say, you know, this is not my this is not my field. Um, I do think that you know uh, there are elements of what I think is so special and incredible about Etel is that is that fusion of um, a sense of uh, connectivity to other times, other places, um, and at the same time, sort of being quite very, you know quite clearly a Californian uh, poet and artist and and that is what has been most inspiring to me, the sort of a, a vision of a cosmopolitan California. I just, you know, I think it's in, in you know, Jenny to Mount Tamapayas, but, you know, she talks about um, Ali, Akbar, uh, Ali Akbar Khan, who was this tremendously uh, successful and, and beautiful um, musician who lived in Marin for a very, very long time, who's, um, you know, whose work I remember only discovering through um, through Etel's book. Um, but, you know, you know, it, I don't know, there's just there's just such a tremendous sort of synthesis that she's able to do. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean, that condensation um, is, is powerful. Yeah, this last week I was teaching the work of the Persian poet uh, Furu Farazad, and uh, we had her translator, Sholay Wolpe, come into class to talk about um, her work and her influences. And she was a poet, you know, writing in the 60s and 70s and really trying to break from tradition and, you know, create a modernist female poetry. Um, and yet her work is steeped in the classic, the Persian classics. Um, there are allusions, you know, they were lost on me, but not to the translator. Sholay Wolpe has also translated Attar, the Sufi uh, mystic, the conference of the birds. And so she could see, she could see that continuity was not broken, even though she's trying, Farzad is trying to make, um, make a break with tradition. She's so steeped in it that she can't, you know, it's, it's just part of the fabric of her being. And I feel I feel that way through a tell that you know her writing is just the sum of everything that she's read or or experienced. Um, didn't she say that in the video? That's what the personality is, or the product of our experiences. You know, it's all it's all in our head, and um, uh, we're biological, but we're also mythological. <laughs> I would just add to what Denise just said. I think that the interesting thing about modernism in other parts of the world is that the, you know, in, in, in this part of the world, again, to go back to, to Megan's point, there's a sort of a sense of a complete break with history. That's not true in the way that modernism has manifested in other parts of the world. It's very much in dialogue. Um, and I think that so rather than being necessarily something that you couldn't break from, I think it's perhaps like, you know, conscious, um, sort of a conscious uh, reworking. Um, that is part of that kind of a, a, a rethinking of, of what modernism looks like elsewhere that has to do with, you know, just, yeah, context and time. Oh. By the way, I see that Trisha Lowe um, put in, answered the question about to look at the sea, the reprint of to look at the sea in progress. Well, um, I think let's, um, I'm, if folks are open to this, we'll turn off the recording, but allow folks to stick around for the next 10 minutes or so. We'll, we'll close at 1215.